again. So signal generation, this is the way that we generate electrical potentials. And electrical potentials uh, are going to be a difference in concentration of electrically charged particles. A difference in concentration of electrically charged particles. And it has to really be across some sort of barrier. We'll just have to adapt. Yeah, I don't. Okay. <laughs> okay, so a difference in concentration of electrically charged particles. So we need a barrier to separate the two pockets or the two buckets of concentration. Uh, you've hopefully seen something similar to this before. It's called a voltmeter or a potentiometer. Uh, and it basically is detailing the difference between the charge, the overall, char overall charge inside of this model cell, so in the cytosol, and then this area here outside of the cytosol, which if it's in an experimental prep is going to be some sort of medium that uh, we're bathing the the cell within. If it's inside of a normal human, it would just be the extracellular fluid. So intracellular fluid charge versus extracellular fluid charge. And so we have a difference in those concentrations of electrically charged particles. And we've actually sort of talked about this just a little bit already with muscle, but remember neurons respond to, uh, to stimuli and are excitable to a much higher degree. Okay. The two main particles that uh, are involved in the signal generation in neurons are going to be potassium with a positive charge and sodium with a positive charge. Now, the differences across the barrier, when the barrier becomes permeable, those differences can lead to or generate flow of charged particles called ions. So if I had some sort of hole that can be produced in the barrier there and I'd have my positive ions begin to rush in, that movement of those charged particles across that barrier generates flow. The flow of any charged particle is referred to as current. So these lights here, there's a switch, right? This is the barrier. There are wires that lead out to a power plant someplace. Then there are wires that lead up into the lights. There are um, wires that lead from the other side of the light back out to the power plant. On one side of the power plant, there's negatively charged electrons. On the other side, there are positively charged electron acceptors. That is a potential. It's a difference in concentration of charged particles. Okay? I turn that switch on, and I've now created a way for those electrons to go from one side to the other side, to cross the barrier. And in doing so, the light comes on, and that's called current. Okay. 
the differences in charged particles on either side of the barrier, that potential is called voltage. And it's measured in volts. Current is me measured in amps or amperage. So we could measure current. We would measure current in a biological system in milliamps, milliamps of current. We also can generate different size currents depending on how different the voltage is on either side of the barrier. Those differences in voltage are differences in concentrations of those charged particles called ions. And when we have differences across the, the, the barrier, what do we call that? I'll give you a hint. I'm going to draw you a little picture here real quick. Memory. The difference in the concentration of ions. You're getting closer. The difference in concentration, these two different groups, this is a whole bunch of positives on this side, this is a whole bunch of negatives on this side of the barrier. So we refer to this as being polarized. I have differences on one side versus the other side. So those differences in the ion, differences in the ions are polarized. It shouldn't surprise you that in order for a cell to function, the cell needs to be polarized. Just like a battery to turn on a light or a light bulb like in your flashlight, that battery has to be polarized as well. If the battery is not polarized, it's not charged. And you have near equal numbers or closer to equal numbers of positive and negative, and so voltage goes to zero. When voltage goes to zero, there's no way to generate current. Current is what actually does the work. Okay? So we have to be able to maintain the polarization of the membrane. In order for the membrane to function and to work when the membrane needs to function and to work, such as to generate a signal to transmit down the axon of the, um, of the neuron. So in our neurons, we have a difference in the ions across the membrane, the biological membrane. And we already know that that biological membrane is selectively permeable and can turn on and off what materials can cross through that membrane to generate the current. So we need to maintain this polarity across our membrane. We need to have our extracellular fluid and our intracellular fluid, those two compartments, to remain at different concentrations of overall charge. We would call that our normal condition or our resting condition. So when the cell membrane is in its normal or its resting condition, it has a voltage. That voltage is referred to as the RMP, which is an acronym. And it stands for resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential. Inside of a neuron, this resting membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts. The 70 millivolts is just referencing the fact that that is a concentration difference. If it was zero, there would be no concentration difference in charge across the membrane. As you go towards infinity in either direction, positive or negative, you are increasing the amount of voltage that is present. The more voltage, the higher potential or the higher work or current that can be generated. Okay? This socket here is 120 volts and can generate an amperage um, up to about 15 amps. The power plant that generates that is 10,000 volts or more and can generate currents in excess of 15 amps. 
your whole house can generate, if you turned everything on, you could generate a 200 amp current through your house. This will show you by the way, so I'll try to see that. <laughs> Minus 70 millivolts is going to be a very small voltage, but it's in terms of the cell, a very big voltage that can generate a really nice current to generate a very nice signal. What about the minus sign? 70 millivolts, that's just simply a reference to the potential, but what about the minus sign? Why is it minus 70 millivolts? Whenever we evaluate voltage potentials inside of cells, we always consider or take the voltage in reference to the, extra, the uh, intracellular fluid. And the intracellular fluid is always more negative. So the negative sign just represents that the cell at rest is more negative in the cell, in the intracellular fluid. <clears throat> okay, we have to maintain minus 70 millivolts. So how are we actually going to maintain minus 70 millivolts in our neurons? I'm going to call this the formation of my RMP, my resting membrane potential. Okay? First, we have to understand a little bit more of the cellular anatomy. You help if I spelled anatomy, right? The cellular anatomy that helps us to, oh, that's right, to generate our resting membrane potential. So what you're looking at here is our lipid bilayer. We have a uh, channel here, and then notice that we have a whole bunch of positive and negative stuff here, and a whole bunch of positive and negative stuff here. And this might actually be surprising you just a little bit, but we're going to get through it, and you're going to understand, hopefully by the end of this, why there's actually a voltage here, why this is considered to be polarized. So let's start with the cell membrane. What is the cell membrane actually doing? The cell membrane separates or compartmentalizes the intracellular fluid from the extracellular fluid. So it separates or it creates a block between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. Now we also know that the cell membrane is selectively permeable. And this is going to come back into the equation at some point. Now you can see that inside of the membrane we have proteins that act as channels. And there are actually a whole host of channels that are bound up in the membrane. And these are going to allow ions to cross. Things like potassium and sodium. So in that cell membrane, we can make the cell permeable because of the channels that are present. We can use those channels to create pores through the membrane to allow specifically potassium or specifically sodium to cross. <clears throat> Normally, those channels, and at rest, the resting membrane potential, those channels are going to be closed, and they're going to prevent any perceptible movement or large amounts of movement of those ions across the membrane at rest. <clears throat> We also have electrolytes involved, <clears throat> things like sodium and potassium. You'll also see that chloride um, is present in this example. And then we're going to talk about what that A is in just a couple of minutes. That's actually not an electrolyte, uh, but we'll get back to that. So just bear with me. So we are concerned about the electrolytes that are at the very periphery of the membrane. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is you have a very small amount of 
space here, right up next to the membrane. And as we go deeper in, we get closer and closer to things like the nucleus. We are not concerned about the electrolytes <clears throat> that are around the nucleus. We are concerned about the very small pocket of liquid that's right up next to the membrane itself, on either side, on the intracellular side and on the extracellular side. So there's this layer right below the membrane on both sides of these electrolyte solutions. And those are the solutions that we're talking about right now. That's the voltages that we're measuring and the currents that we're going to be able to measure when we're no longer at rest. These electrolytes <coughs> are unequally distributed. So what do I mean by unequally distributed? <clears throat> well, it means that on one side there's more sodium, and on one side there's more potassium. So if we first take a look at our extracellular fluid, what's going on out here, what can you tell me about extracellular fluid in reference to concentration of sodium? It's hot. So extracellular, so, uh, extracellular fluid, our sodium concentration is high. If I give you a number, 145 milli equivalents per liter. Just think of this as being lots of sodium in the extracellular fluid. What about potassium? What's that? Really low. Yes. So potassium in the extracellular fluid is really low. It's actually 4 milli equivalents per liter. Okay, so that's the extracellular fluid, but we know it's unequally distributed. So before I give you this, this next point, which is our concentrations in the intracellular fluid, what do you think we're going to find out about sodium concentration in the intracellular fluid? It's going to be really, really low. And so what am I doing here? What am I establishing? Sodium is 12 milli equivalents per liter. I'm establishing concentration gradients. And then potassium is going to be higher or low. Really high, and it's going to be up around 150 milli equivalents per liter. So if I draw this out, here's my membrane. This is my extracellular fluid out here. This is my intracellular fluid down here. Sodium is very high outside, so I typically draw that with a very big sodium. And then on the inside, sodium is much smaller. We'll put a small sodium. Potassium is much higher here. Potassium is much lower here. And that sets up my concentration gradients. Okay? Now, if you go through and sort of do the math, and just get rid of sodium and potassium and just think charges, you'll see that 150 and 12 gives me 162, and 145 and 4 gives me 149. And they're both positive charges, and they're not really that much different. There's a slight difference, but the slight difference actually favors the intracellular fluid to be more positive. So how is it minus 70 millivolts? And the answer to that is the A's. So in addition to our electrolytes, we have another group of charged molecules that are called anions. And these are more accurately referred to as immovable anions. So these are going to be molecules that are trapped inside of the cell that have an overall negative charge and highly influence the charge in the cell. The anions are going to include things like RNA and proteins and DNA and acids and ATP. These are all molecules that are literally stuck inside of the membrane, don't readily cross. The reason they don't readily cross, one, there's no way to make the membrane permeable. Two, they're just simply really large. So these are larger molecules. 
and they don't easily cross the membrane. And so they're stuck inside the membrane or they're immovable from the membrane. Okay? So if I go back to the picture that I just drew here, got my extracellular fluid and my intracellular fluid. There's actually more positive charges here if we just look at the ref if we just reference electrolytes in, in, inside the cell versus outside the cell. But then we have that big negative influence from our immovable anions, and so that brings it down to about minus 70 millivolts. But here's one of the things we're going to go and talk about the physiology here in just a second. Here's one of the things that you kind of need to know about. Um, chemistry and physics and biology, we always have to play by the rules of thermodynamics. And thermodynamics states that everything is tending towards disorder. And what that means is if we just leave a system alone, it's eventually going to begin to degrade. So to maintain that system, we have to have inputs of energy. This building, you come back in a hundred years and the paint's going to be falling off of the walls. We don't take care of it. The paint will be falling off of the walls. The bricks will be falling apart. Come back in a hundred years. I'll be 135 years old now. I'm probably going to fall off. I'll be walking around. Hair's falling out. What? I'll be hung in the lab. Oh my god! <laughs> this is so scary! <laughs> Like, I'm gonna hate you. Oh, I'll be like the skeletons. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Could you imagine if you had to do a cadaver and you walked in and it was like one of your former teachers oh. or something like that? <laughs> or your grandma? Oh, oh, oh my god. <laughs> my neighbor across the street, um, she wants her dot bot body to be donated to um, to University of Georgia. Like specifically? Yeah, like specifically. She's her name is Mary and she's a nice old lady. Her husband's no Go guys. Go <laughs> her, her whole heritage is, is yeah, is University of Georgia. And she told me that one day and I was like, I don't think I'll ever go to University of Georgia to be a faculty member, but if I do I really hope I don't teach the lab that <laughs> Oh, this was my neighbor. She was a sweet old lady, loved my kids. Really nice. Okay, well, let's uh, dissect out the uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh, the things that go through my brain. It's kind of scary in here. Okay, so the physiology, we are constantly under a state of tending towards disorder. So we need to input energy to maintain the system. So we want to maintain our resting membrane potential at minus 70 millivolts. However, even without channels open, our membranes are a little bit weak. So in terms of potassium, where is potassium the highest? Inside. Inside the cell. Potassium is the most permeable. <clears throat> and the most permeable means that in relative terms it crosses the membrane pretty easily. Now, <clears throat> even though it crosses the membrane pretty easily, and this is directly through the membrane, not through a channel, it's not near as much current across the membrane as what we would have if a channel, a potassium channel opened up, but it's still perceptible. So in terms of the cell membrane, let's put our figure back up here. So we can reference it. By the way, I would kind of commit this to memory. So you get a question. On the nervous system, you can kind of say, okay, so this is where this, this is the start. Okay, so potassium crosses the membrane pretty easily. So how is potassium going to travel across the membrane? Well, 
that's crossing the membrane, not through a channel. Right through the membrane. It would be like if this wall, I could just go right through it. If I had a glorified body, I don't know if that's true or not, but some people have used that as, never mind. Um, anyways, goes right through the membrane. I don't need to open up a gate. Come on, you do know. How will potassium move? Okay, concentration gradients. Okay, I guess I'm going to have to like ask everybody to stand up and like go in their corner and just like stand there shoulder to shoulder. Where are you going to want to go? You're going to want to stay there with all your friends? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where are you going to want to go? This way. Any other place where there's not a bunch of you, right? Sodium is really high here. Yeah. So they want to die. Okay, so sodium is going to go. It's going to leak through the membrane, and it's going to leak from inside to outside. <laughs> That's your own fault. You're making it more complicated than I'm, than I'm, I'm making, making it. What's on my high Start with the simplest okay. answer. I mean, seriously. What? Like you walk into a you walk into a patient's room, and you're like, oh wow, they have a runny nose. Well, so I mean, it could be that uh, you have uh, some really rare disease that only 47 people in the world have. I think that's where we start. <laughs> or you have a cold. <laughs> Always start with the simplest answer and give me that. Then I'll call you an idiot if I want more, more specific. <laughs> so if it's traveling inside to outside, we would refer to this in terms of concentration gradient. We would refer to it as the ion is traveling uh, down its concentration gradient. And it's going from, high to low. from high to low. Oh, gotcha. Oh, gotcha. Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> Okay, so it's traveling down its concentration gradient. All right, so now the question becomes, as you're still thinking about this, potassium is traveling down its concentration gradient. So the question is, in terms of charge of the intracellular fluid, what is happening to the charge? Okay, I'm hearing more positive, I'm hearing more negative, I'm also hearing blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Okay, so it's going to become more negative. So charge in the intracellular fluid is becoming more negative. We're starting at minus 70 millivolts. If it's becoming more negative, we're going to minus 80, minus 90, minus 100. We're tending towards minus infinity, okay? But we want to maintain our resting membrane potential, right? We want to maintain it at minus 70 millivolts. So we're going to have to do something to counteract this. However, we're not done yet with tending towards disorder. Does everybody have all of this? Okay, so we now have that leak of potassium out of the cell, and so we're becoming more and more negative. So what are some of the consequences of becoming more and more negative? So number three was ICF charge more negative, so this is a point. Number one would be like that, every double dot. So what are some of the consequences of this? Well, that negative charge that's continually building, it's now going to begin to exert a larger pull. Okay, so this is increasingly becoming more and more negative. 
we know that opposites attract. And that's why an ugly guy like me can have a beautiful wife like I have. <laughs> we still love things, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. It's just, it's. <laughs> You love me, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right, so negative charge exerts this larger and larger pull. And so what that means is this is continually becoming bigger, right? And as it does, it pulls on things that are positively charged. And so we actually have some of that potassium that's lost getting pulled back in, passes back into the cell. And so if I were to draw this, I would draw this as sort of a really, really big arrow here. And then we have sort of this small amount of charge that's coming back because it's being pulled by that increasingly negative charge. A lot of it goes out, but then some of it slips back in because of that increasing larger and larger negative charge. So pulled by the negative charge. And we get to a point where the outflow of potassium, the leak of potassium, and then the pull of potassium back in, they balance out. So the concentration gradient and the, the, the flow that's induced by that concentration gradient, I should say, and then that electric pole they're going to balance out. So in other words, it's not going to continue to go more and more and more and more negative. We're going to get to a point where it's going to sort of balance out. Now what's the charge that we're trying to maintain? Minus 70 millivolts. So if we only consider potassium on its own, the function or the, the influx and outflow of potassium, our resting membrane potential would even out at about minus 90 millivolts. So about minus 90 millivolts if only the potassium were to be involved. But we have sodium. And sodium also crosses the membrane. However, when sodium crosses the membrane, it does not happen near as easily as potassium. So not as easily as that bar potassium. And I might have to draw a picture real quick. How is the potassium, uh, how is the sodium going to cross? Um, okay, what are we going to call that? Yeah. We're going to go down our concentration gradient. So sodium begins to slip in. But it's not just down the concentration gradient. What else is going to influence it? That electrical pole. Because we continually have potassium exerting or creating a, a, a pole from the negative charge. So it's pulled by the negative charge into the intracellular fluid. What's going to happen to the overall charge of the cell, intracellular fluid? It's going to become more positive. So if just potassium was involved, how much charge did we have? We went from minus 70 down to minus 90. Now we're going to become more positive. 
So it's going to reduce the negative charge. And actually, that may not be the best thing to say, because reduce would indicate that it's becoming more negative. So let's say that it increases the negative charge, in particular inside of the cell. And that'll get us up to about minus 65 millivolts. OK, we're still not at minus 70 millivolts. So we're still not good enough here. So potassium on its own, minus 90, add in sodium, now minus 65 millivolts. So we went from negative 90 to negative 65. Mm -hmm. And really, all of this is happening simultaneously. So it's not like the cell is 90 and then it goes up to minus 65. We're saying if it was just potassium, it would be minus 90, but it's not just potassium, it's also sodium. So if it was just sodium and potassium leak, it would be minus 65, but it's really not minus 65, so there's another mechanism. And the last mechanism is centered around a protein called a sodium-potassium pump. Now, what do you already know about the sodium-potassium pump? Okay, it's going to require ATP because it's a pump. What else is it? What else is it? What is it going to do? It pumps sodium and it pumps potassium. And where is it pumping them? Okay, so across the membrane. And sodium is going to move hot. No, we're pumping. Oh, sodium goes in and potassium. I'm not sure you really are all confident in that. I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong. In terms of concentration gradients, we're going down the concentration gradient. Oh, if you're pumping it, then you're We're going to go against the concentration gradient. All right, so because it's a pump, Energy is going to be required. Where are we going to get our energy from? ATP. Every time, and, and the pump, we're going to call it a duty cycle. D-U-T-Y. One duty cycle. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Thirty-five-year-olds. Like, we're like perfectly linked. All these little kids in here are just like, I don't, oh, I'm not like, I get it now. <laughs> okay, so the poopy cycle, <laughs> the duty cycle, <laughs> the duty cycle, one rotation of the pump, so to speak, is going to pump three sodium ions out. And it's going to pump two potassium ions in. So one cycle is one rotation of the pump? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, three out, sodium, two potassium in. So let's draw our figure up here again. Got our negative charge here. Potassium is high, sodium is low. Sodium is high. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Potassium is low. Okay, so we can add now in a pump. That's our pump. So we have our leak. Some sodium leaks back out, and then there's a small amount, or some potassium leaks out, small amount of potassium leaks back in. And then we're going to have. the leak of the sodium, okay, minus 65 millivolts. Now, we're going to have three sodium that come back out, and two potassium that go back in, okay? So if you go through and you do the math, how many charges each duty cycle <laughs> Uh, how many charges in each duty cycle am I losing a net charge? Yeah. 
I have three positive charges leaving, two positive charges coming back in. <laughs> three charges leave. I'm really, I, I want. There we go. Three charges leave. <laughs> the two charges come back in. So I have a loss of one. <laughs> so a net of one positive is going to be lost per pump cycle from the intracellular fluid. So a loss of one from the intracellular fluid. We were at plus 65 if we just considered the leak of sodium and potassium. Now we're pumping out a net of one sodium. We also are, by the way, maintaining our concentration gradients, right? We're maintaining, we're basically replacing a lot of what was lost. So sodium is leaking, or potassium is leaking out, and we're bringing potassium back in. Sodium is leaking out of the extracellular fluid, and we're putting it back into the extracellular fluid. So each cycle we go, uh, we lose one positive charge. If we're losing one positive charge, that means that we're becoming more negative inside of the cell. And as we become more negative inside the cell, we go from minus 65 to minus 68 millivolts. What's the after loss? Per pump cycle from extra, in the intracellular fluid. <laughs> So the sodium potassium pump accounts for about minus three millivolts. Now in all reality, that brings us to about minus 68 from the minus 65. But depending on status of the organism, it actually can move down to minus 70 millivolts as well. So the true resting membrane potential is right around minus 68 to minus 70 millivolts. The Resting membrane potential. By the way, you probably have heard before that you should roughly eat about 2,000 calories a day. About 50% of that caloric intake goes towards producing ATP to function the sodium potassium pumps and all of your different organs and cell types. So about 1,000 calories of ATP produced just so your sodium potassium pumps can operate and maintain rescue membrane potentials in a variety of different types of cells. Mm -hmm.